Hey guys, welcome to the introduction to C programming course by Shikshak Academics. This course is very, very essential for those who want to learn programming, build a career around programming, or even uh, the first year engineering graduates. This is a compulsory subject for most of the first year engineering graduates. We'll start from the absolute basics and we'll build our concepts as we move forward. However, if you already know a little bit about the various components of the computer, it will do you some good along the way. Um, don't worry, I have got you covered in that grounds. You can check this video, the link should be somewhere around here. And that will give you some tips about how you can build your own PC, how you can configure it, repair it, upgrade it, and lots of other fun things to know. But otherwise, without any delay, let's start. Okay, a little bit of history lesson. The C programming language was built around 1970 at the Bell Laboratories by this guy, who's Dennis Ritchie. He's responsible for building the most famous programming language till date. Today, the C programming language is used from large supercomputers, data centers to small microcontrollers and embedded systems. It was a language of choice for building operating systems such as Unix and Windows, and also other programming languages such as the Java Runtime Environment or the Python Interpreter. Well, to summarize, you can say that today almost all technological advancement owes its existence to the C programming language. In 1989, the American National Standards Institute standardized the protocols for writing C programs, and since then it has been known as ANSI C. A lot of other derivatives and extensions to the original C programming language has also been built, such as C++, C Sharp, Objective C, and so on. Okay, enough about the history. Now, to run a C program, what we need is a C compiler. A compiler is responsible for converting the human written set of instructions, which is called as the program or the source code, to the machine understandable string of binary numbers, which can then be converted to electrical impulses for the various components of the computer. While there are numerous C compilers in today's market, one of my personal favorite is the GCC. It can be natively run by most Unix-based platforms and also Windows through the min GW application or the minimalist GNU for Windows. It is recognized by most of the modern IDs and working with it is just a piece of cake. Other than the compiler, we also need a text editing application, something like Notepad for Windows or maybe gedit for Linux to write the program. Once we have written the program, we can compile it and execute it in any command line interface. For Windows, we can use the CMD and for Linux, we can use the terminal. Well, this setup is more than enough for running short programs, but for larger programs, it is better to switch to an integrated development environment or an IDE. There are numerous types of IDs available in today's market. In the later part of the course, we'll be checking out how to use one of these IDs. But for now, we'll be using simply a notepad and a command prompt. So now let's switch over to the monitor. So let's open the text editor and the command prompt interface. A C is basically a procedural language. What it means is that Everything inside the program is a procedure or a function call. And there is one special function which is called as the main function. Now the main function defines the main body of the code and it shows the compiler from where it can start to translate the source code into the binary executable code. Now the main function is written as the word main followed by a pair of parentheses. Anywhere this pair of parentheses will signify that this word refers to a function. Now the body of the main function is written within a pair of curly braces. Now whatever set of instructions I write within this pair of curly braces, I'm basically asking the compiler to convert this source code into the binary code. For now, let's save this file and try to compile and execute it. To save this file, we can go to save as, we can choose a location of our choice, but while saving we have to mention that the extension of the file is .c. So let's name this file as test and the extension should be .c. All C programs should have this extension of .c. So let's save it now. To 
compile it, we first needs to be present inside that path. So let me go to that path. So inside here, if you check, I have this test.c file available. To compile a C file, what we need to do is the command gcc followed by the name of the file test.c. What this does is it will convert this C program or the source code to a binary executable file that we are going to see in a moment. Now here you will see that we have generated some kind of warning. So it might generate errors or warnings which means that there might be something wrong with your code. In, case, in this case we have a warning but a warning will not stop the compiler from creating the executable but it is telling us that there might be some problem if we try to run it. Anyways, we will deal with this warning later. But for now, let us run the executable file. But the question is, where is the executable file? Uh, if you go to that specific directory, you will see other than test.c, we have another file which is created called a.exe. If you're working in Linux, this file would be called as a.out. Now, this file name a it is the default file name you get when you compile a C program. If you want to have a specific file name, you can have something like say uh, gcc test.c. So this will compile the code. But if I want the file name to be specific, then I have to write the parameter hyphen o followed by the output file name. So let's say I want the output file name to be test.out. Okay. So if I press enter again, that same warning is generated. We'll deal with the warning later. But let's now try to execute this file. So to execute this file in Windows, we can simply write test.out. In case of Linux, you should have written dot slash then text.out. Anyways, now if we write test.out and print enter, we'll see that nothing is happening. Now, why nothing is happening? Because inside the main body of the code, I've written nothing. So now let's write something and let's try to get it to work. So what can we do? Uh, let's say we want to display some kind of message in the console window to ensure that our program is executing correctly. Now, uh, for example, when we want some information which is within the computer as a more uh, hard copy in our hand, what we do? We just print it out as using a printer. Similarly, if we want some data to be printed on this command prompt from the uh, environment of the code, then we use a function which is called as print. So the name of the function is print. However, this is a special function. So which is actually called as print f. The f signifies that it is going to output something called as the formatted string. Now why the formatted string? As we have discussed before, everything inside the computer is in the binary format. So if it prints that binary data directly to us, then we won't understand. So to make us understand, it will format that binary code in the proper format so that it is easier for us to read. So we have a formatted string as outputs. So let's say the string is <coughs> hello Shiksha. The double quotes signify that this piece of uh, text is a string and uh, we can display this uh, and we can use the printf function to display any kind of string. Now, to signify the end of this statement, we need to use a special operator, which is called as a semicolon operator. Now, why do we need to do this? This is because while writing the function, I could have written it very well as something like this. I can write the entire program in one line and it would still work. Why we do it in separate lines? So some people write it like this. Some people will write it like this. Some people wants the bracket to uh, you know, be placed like this. This is just for beautifying the code in making it more readable. But the C program doesn't really care about it. What it cares about is the semicolon operator, which signifies when this statement has ended. Now, the question is, we have already mentioned that uh, printf, this printf function, as I have told before, anything within a pair of uh, braces will signify that it's a function. So this printf function, it is supposed to display this string in our command prompt, but we have not defined the function in any way that will allow it to do so. So where is this function defined? Thankfully, the inventors of C have taken the pain of writing the definition of this function. 
So the definition of the printer function is written in the standard input output library. So the file is called as stdio.h. H signifies that this is a header file and header file contains lots of library functions that can be included along with our codes to offer us advanced functionalities. Now stdio.h, if I want to include this function in our code, I have to use something called a preprocessor directive. So preprocessor directive can look something like this. So this hash include is a special type of preprocessor directive which allows us to include other files in our code. Now why am I calling it preprocessor directive? Because the main process it starts from the main function, right? Now this header file, this has to be included before the main process starts. So it's a preprocessor and the directive signifies the directions that are need to be followed before the processing starts. So one of them is to include the standard input output header file. Now this file contains the definition of printf and this would allow us to use this function to display this string on our screen. So let's check that. Let's compile the code again gcc test.c this time we are going to keep the output file as a.ex itself so no special names again a warning is generated in the main function we are going to ignore this warning for now but we will clarify that after this and uh, if i want to run the code now you see that when we run the code it is displaying us the message that we have we are trying to display right Right, so now let's go to the warning. If you see that it is saying that the warning is return type defaults to int. What it means is that the main function by default, it is supposed to return an integer value. As I told you, a function is supposed to take a set of inputs and produce a specific type of output. So the main function by default produces an output of integer. In this case, if we do not want to get any kind of output, that means we do not want our main functions to produce any output. We can simply write as void. But the standard practice is to keep it as int. Why we do that is when we are writing just one single code, then it's well and good. No problem because if uh, it's a void main, the main function will work and it will do what is supposed to do, then the program will end. But if we are working with a lots of program and if one specific program fails to work, then we would like to know which program has failed. For that, the main function of that specific program should return some value. Now, the default protocol, as I said, is to use the int and for every successful completion, it should return a zero, right? Anytime there is some kind of error within the program, it will return something other than zero. Now, this is the complete uh, Hello World program or as I like to call it, the Hello Shikshak program. And you can again uh, check the program, just gcc test.c. Now you see we are not getting any warning in the compilation process. And if I want to execute, hello Shiksha, it's showing me well and good. Okay, so let's wrap up this session till here because we have talked a little bit about the history of the C programming. We have also talked about what is a C compiler and what it does. And then we have talked about this small Hello Shikshak program where we have discussed the utility of the main function, how the printf function works and how we can include header files to use special functions. And finally, how to compile the code and how to run the code. That's all for this video. In the next video, we'll be talking about how we can take inputs from the user. We'll be talking about things like variables, data types, identifiers and keywords and further along we'll also learn about conditions and loops. So stay connected with the channel for these videos which are coming very soon and if you like the video drop a like, uh, ask any doubts in the comments I would love to answer them and if you uh, really like this video and share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon for getting the future updates as soon as I post them. Till next time, ciao ciao, bye bye, best of luck.